Okay, so we're talking about complex numbers. So looking closely at the use of the letter I as a way of representing a number. So I want you to be able to compare and contrast real numbers with the imaginary numbers. You know the square root of 16 is 4. That's something that for sure is locked into your brain. But the square root of negative 16 is something that's a little bit more unfamiliar, right? If you push this in your calculator, it's not totally going to agree with you. And in fact, your calculator won't agree with you, that is. And in fact, mathematicians really didn't start working with square roots and negative numbers until about the mid-1500s. They kind of didn't understand how they worked. They knew that a positive number times itself would give another positive number, and that a negative number times itself would give a negative number, right? They thought of these squares in terms of areas. Well, you can't have negative 16 square feet. That doesn't make sense. And so for mathematicians, they called these um, situations where they saw the square root of negative numbers as impossible, imaginary, false. They just didn't understand how they could exist. And so they kind of had to develop or construct different methods of working with them. Um, one was called doing a plus of minus, which sounds terrible. Why would, why would you want to talk about the plus of minus 16? That sounds funny, but that was a shorthand that they came up with. It wasn't actually until around the 1900s, so just about 100 to 150 years ago, because it was late 1800s, probably would be a better way to say it, that they really started working with um, imaginary numbers the way that we're going to be working with them. Right? The square root of negative 16, we will say, is 4i. And that i is a construct that's been developed by mathematicians where i represents the square root of negative 1. And that little tiny equation actually has some huge ramifications for us. It introduces a whole new set of numbers, right? It introduces the imaginary numbers, and the imaginary numbers are in the form bi. So like 2i, or 7i, or as we just looked at, 4i. b is the real number part, and i is the imaginary unit. Now we've already defined the imaginary unit as the square root of negative 1. If we square that number bi, the result is whatever b squared is, and then we make it negative. Okay, so the square root of 4i, or excuse me, 4i squared is negative 16. 4 squared is 16, make it negative. Okay, so how do we simplify imaginary numbers? Let's look at two examples. The first one is the square root of negative 64. Okay, you know from practice you've done with square roots that the square root of negative 64 is the square root of 64 and the square root of negative 1. You can split it up like that. And once you have it split up like that, it's pretty easy to work with. The square root of 64 is 8, the square root of negative 1 is i, and so the answer is 8i. A lot like the square root of positive 64, but with just a little letter tagged on the end. Okay, let's look at one that's a little bit tougher. First of all, there's a negative out in front, which we're going to have to carry through to the end, and then it's the square root of a negative 96. Negative 96, or 96, is not a perfect square, and so we have to just do some fancier simplifying. First thing we would want to do is pull out that negative 1. We know this is going to have an i in it. We know that our solution is going to be some number i because of that negative sign under the radical. Now, square root of 96 is not pretty. It simplifies to 16 and 6. 16 times 6 equals 96. And so when we simplify this down, we're actually going to get negative 4i, right, because this will be a 4 from the square root of 16. This will be an i. And then the radical always goes last. If there's ever a radical, it goes last. And the radical square root of 6 doesn't get to simplify, which is kind of a bummer, but you got to do what you can with what you have. Okay, so we get negative 4i square root of 6. That's kind of messy. This was beautiful. This is a little messy. But it's the same process, and I want you to get good at that. So now you try. I'm going to give you two. The first one is this, negative the square root of negative 36. Okay, some of you might be able to do this in your head, but quick, give it a try. Split it up just like we just did, and see what you can make happen here. Okay? How'd you do? Did you get that the square root of negative 36 is 36 and negative 1? I really, really hope so. That's something that needs to become kind of automatic. A lot of you maybe can make the jump from right here to down here. This middle step maybe is a waste of time for you. Maybe it confuses you. Okay? But when the number is not a perfect square, that step's going to become a little bit more important to help us see the pieces. Okay? The square root of negative 48 has a few more steps to simplify. We're going to first of all think about 48 and negative 1 to introduce that i, because the square root of negative 1 is i, and then 48 splits into 16 and 3. Okay, so the square root of 16 and the square root of 3 
they make up the square root of 48. And the square root of 16 is 4. The square root of negative 1 is i, so there's the 4i. And then the square root of 3 tacks on the end, because we can't forget it, but it doesn't exactly fit with the 4i. Okay. So now, having imaginary numbers introduces us to the complex numbers, right? A complex number is a number that uses real parts and imaginary parts. It's always of the form a plus bi. We could also see a minus bi, right? So this could be plus or minus. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Right here, the a part is real. This is always a real number. And then the imaginary part, well, that's an imaginary number. It's going to have an i with it, right? So we use the real numbers. If you're looking at a real number, that means b is 0. You have the imaginary numbers. And if you're looking at an imaginary number, that means a is 0. So b is 0. A is 0. When both of them are not equal to 0, then we get our complex number, like 3 plus 7i, or 4 minus i. Okay? This is how a solution to a quadratic equation would look. If we're going to solve a quadratic equation, we're going to, oh, my bad, we're going to have a case of an a plus or minus a bi. So let's look at how that would actually look. Let's look at a quick example of solving a quadratic. Now, the quadratic here is x squared plus 2x plus 2. And if you wanted to solve that, you would have some choices. First of all, it's not going to factor. You could graph it, but when you graph it, it's going to be above the axis, and you're not going to have a graphed out solution. So you have completing the square quadratic formula. I'm a quadratic formula person, but this would be another opportunity where you could complete the square if you wanted to. Remember, whenever you're solving a quadratic, this f of x is going to equal 0. Okay? So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Yep, world's best singer right here, this girl. Anyway, negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 2 squared minus 4, 1, 2, 4ac all over 2a. Negative 2 plus or minus 4 minus 8. Well, right there we can see that we have a negative 4 right here. That's a negative 4, and so that kind of sucks, but it's not a big deal because we know that the square root of negative 4 is going to be 2i. Notice the plus or minus has not changed. The square root of negative 4 comes down as 2i. So negative 2 plus or minus 2i. And then, of course, over 2. So what we have here is when we divide both by 2, we get negative 1 plus or minus i. The solutions are negative 1 plus i and negative 1 minus i. So we walked all the way through, and then when we hit right here, that's when things got a little bit funky, but we were fine. We got this. Neg square root of negative 4 is 2i. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of negative 1 is i. You try. There's your, there's your quadratic equation. x squared minus 12x plus 45. You try. When I show you the solution in a second, it's going to be quadratic formula. So if you're trying to decide what the best way to go about it would be, try the quadratic formula. See what you can make happen. Okay? How did you do? Negative b, oh that's ugly, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. 12 plus or minus the square root of the quantity 144 minus 180. Then negative 36 simplifies nicely. It simplifies into 6i. So this negative 36 is 6i. So we get 12 plus or minus 6i over 2. And when we divide both of these by 2, we get 6 plus or minus 3i. The solutions here are 6 plus 3i and 6 minus 3i, because the plus or minus splits it up. Now, because of the plus or minus in the quadratic equation, or even from the square root when completing the square right, when we get to that square root step, it's always the plus or minus for it, we always have two solutions to quadratics. And for complex numbers, these are called complex conjugates. What I mean is this. When we're talking about complex numbers, in terms of solving a quadratic, we're going to have a plus bi and a minus bi, right? 6 plus 3i, 6 minus 3i. Negative 1 plus 1i, negative 1 minus 1i. Complex conjugates, okay? Every complex number has a complex conjugate. So if we find a solution to a quadratic equation, we can find the other one because they're complex conjugates.
They always occur in these pairs. Complex roots always occur in pairs. Complex roots always occur in pairs. That's a key piece of information, um, especially as we get further along in solving things. The reason is, is um, we always want that plus or minus when we take the square root, and so it's always going to give us pairs. And so as you're solving these, or as you get solving cubics, or qu um, quartics, or quintics, um, when we get into chapter 6, we're going to solve some big equations. And we need to remember this complex roots always occur in pairs, because that's going to make it, that's a key piece in solving those. So even though right now we're just looking at them in terms of the quadratic formula, a plus bi, a minus bi, this is an important fact for us to remember. Okay? That's a lot of good information about i. It's basically an introduction. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to practice some um, some operations with complex numbers, and then we'll kind of do some other stuff with quadratics to get us further. But complex numbers are pretty sweet. I'm a pretty big fan. Um, I think you will be too. They're not too tough. They're very similar to real numbers, just a couple differences. So I really hope that you can get this figured out. Uh, we'll definitely do lots of good practice with it. So complex numbers, there you have them.